how these more complex brains take visual imagery and make sense of it. They were recording electrical signals from single neurons in the visual cortex at the back of a cat's brain or your brain. So the signal comes from your eyeballs, goes straight through your head to the back. And they were showing pictures of cats and fish, and they weren't getting any neurons that were firing. By accident, as they moved one of the slides out of the way, they noticed that the edge of the slide caused firing in one of these neurons. So what this here illustrates is that very specific orientation. So these are orientations of the bar being shown to the cat. And you can see here that this 45 degree angle elicits a much greater response than even close by orientations. And like many things in statistics, this fits the normal distribution. So what they discovered was that these, in the visual cortex V1, you have these very simple edges being detected, and then those feed up into layers further forward in your brain that represent no longer just straight lines, but uh, corners and more complex shapes. So for example, in our human brain, we have the V1 cortex that I was just describing that detects edges, and then moving further up, those edges merge to form more complex shapes to detect form, motion. We have an area called the fusiform face area that has evolved specifically to detect other human faces. In the machine world, the first attempts to replicate visual scenery uh, came quite a bit after the trial light when Leonardo da Vinci was invented the camera obscura. The first attempt to have machines understand the visual world, well, the first well-documented effort, at least, was the lock world, which Barry Roberts um, came up with, where he was trying to detect these relatively simple structures with machine vision. <clears throat> the first productionized machine vision algorithm was this one developed by Viola and Jones in 2001. And it captures the prominent thinking of the time which was that you need to explicitly code in features that algorithms uh, need to understand faces, houses, boats, whatever. You'd have to come up with some clever algorithm to identify that object. So Viola and Jones algorithms specifically was these black and white bands. So they had two of them in particular that tended to indicate with the highest statistical probability the presence of a face. So this algorithm was simple enough that it was the first one to go into production and went into Canon phones uh, some years after 2001 when the initial paper was published. And you all here probably remember when all of a sudden phones started finding faces automatically as you were taking the photo and focused on that. An alternative to that feature-specific way of analyzing uh, or of uh, algorithmically identifying faces or what have you, is uh, a, a biologically inspired approach. So one of the first of its kind was Fukushima in 1980 with his neurocognition. So he was inspired by Google and Google's cat experiments. And so he coded together an algorithm that was layers of neurons, taking in simple edges, and then gradually having more complex um, features represented at each stage. Now, there were some key things missing for him. One, he didn't have very much data, and two, he was missing something called the backpropagation algorithm, which we'll get into later. So this largely didn't work, but it was a conceptual idea. The first time that this kind of approach, a deep neural net approach, in fact, uh, went into production, was by, um, so Jan LeCun, he's here, he was here at NYU for a long time, and now uh, quite famously leading a very large Facebook AI research team at NYU. And Yoshua Benio was, lead, was and still is uh, leading a large lab at the University of Montreal. So they published this paper where they were looking at MNIST digits, and we're going to talk about these a lot in my talk. So these are handwritten digits. Uh, there were 70,000 of them in the data set. Half of them were written by U.S. Postal Service workers, and the other half were written by school children. So they are typically split into 60,000 training digits and 10,000 digits left over for testing the algorithm. We'll get into more detail later, but just to quickly give you a sense of what's happening here, on the left side, the input of this network, the raw digits are read in as pixels. 
pixels. And then through these feature maps, the representations become increasingly complex. And at the end of the network, uh, is that with some probability of whether this is a zero, a one, or a two, or a three? Whoa. Um, 
So, uh, so like we were describing earlier with the digits and like biological vision, you can see that in the earliest layers, uh, the network is detecting edges and blobs, and then as we move deeper into the network, these are turned into more complex textures, object parts, and then at the end, um, it's actually making guesses about object categories. So today, so from 2012 when Jeff and his team blew image net competition out of the water, to today, we're now seeing deep nets everywhere. So Facebook's uh, face tagging and suggestion, that's a deep learning algorithm. Tesla's self-driving cars, deep learning algorithms. Google inboxes, suggested replies. The tremendous increase in the voice recognition performance on Siri, on your Apple devices, that's deep learning as well. So it's, it's everywhere now, and that's, it's, it's happening more and more. One of the most fun implementations I found in algorithm was this film Sunswing, where they fed uh, hundreds of blockbuster film scripts into um, an LSTM, a type of, of model we'll talk into in the last section, and um, they made a script with it. I won't show too much of this, but it's quite amusing. And you won't be able to hear the audio. Oh, nice. One sec, we're going to do a quick uh, video change up here. Let's see how this goes. Bear that in mind for 
you're going to be doing any very large analysis. The problems with TensorFlow and Theano are that you can't really get a good look into their source code, whereas you can with Cafe and Torch. With respect to RNNs, the natural language processing technique, by far the best is TensorFlow, uh, and Theano is okay with that. And then if you want to be calling these languages with a higher level API, and we'll discuss those in detail in the talk, uh, Keras is your best bet for getting either Piano or TensorFlow, but the easiest language for sure is TFLearn. And we'll go through some examples um, shortly. Finally, uh, at my website, johncrone.com slash resources, I maintain um, a list of the uh, great resources for getting started in this space. And as Jared mentioned, we also run a deep learning study group. Um, so get in touch with me if you're interested in that. Uh, we're trying to keep it relatively small, but it would also be great to have um, more sharp people there. So with respect to theory, let's talk about the building block of artificial neural networks. So, uh, so artificial neural networks are models off of biological neurons. So the way that biological neurons work is they have thousands of dendrites inputting into a single cell body. And then the cell body gets positive or negative changes affected by those all those inputs. And then if the charge changes past a, a specific threshold, then a binary output, a charge, is sent down along the axon to further neurons later on in the neural network of your brain. The perceptron, created by, uh, I can't remember his first name, Paul Rosenblatt, uh, in 1957, is following the same kind of idea. So it has multiple inputs, as many as you like, from either your uh, input values or other parts of the network, feeding into the, some kind of calculation. And if that calculation is, say, above a threshold, then uh, the output, then there's a binary output, a zero or a one. And, and so that mirrors the binary action potential that we see in biological neurons. Um, the problem with this kind of binary output is that Sorry, I was just showing up another adapter where I'm trying to figure out what the problem is, so we apologize for the suffering, but that's the problem. <laughs> Sorry, dude. No, no worries. I actually have a perfect view of the talk. There you go. <laughs> I can turn my laptop around. <laughs> so, the problem with these kind of binary outputs is that once you start, I think that's a more, uh, once you start stacking these perceptrons together, It's very difficult to have any kind of learning happen with the network because small changes in your inputs have these large binary outputs on neurons within the network. So, therefore, have the knock on effect through the network into the output. So, it just makes it difficult to have any kind of um, uh, subtle learning happen. A solution is to instead of having the binary outputs from the neurons, you have now this no longer really represents any kind of biological concept, but you have you use a sigmoid shape, so you take the same kind of function we had in that um, in the in the perceptron, the binary perceptron, and wrap it in a function like a sigmoid function or a tangent function. The only difference being the sigmoid runs from zero to one, the tangent runs from negative one to one. Slightly different curve shape. But the state of the art today is to be using rectified rectified linear units, which, despite having less um, subtlety as a curve, they are far easier to do computations on, far faster to do computations on, rather. And so having more relative units, as opposed to fewer sigmoid or tangent neurons, is faster and more efficient overall. So let's talk about chaining these single neurons together into the network. You can, but I already 
dangerously have too much content. So is it a fast question? Yeah, go ahead. So those extrema actually are a problem for learning because learning the gradient at the extremes is very slow. So that's actually not a it's actually it's actually better that way. Well that's interesting. Well, I mean, this is probably okay.
just gives you a sense of how these algorithms work. So in that demo, I went from a shallow architecture with one hidden layer to a deep layer with multiple hidden layers. It's represented by a diagram like this. Once again, this is a fully connected net where all the nodes of one layer connect to the one that's the other one. So to demonstrate how you might implement this in code specifically, we're going to look at a couple of TF Learn examples. So I built a notebook here, which you can access from my slides. And so it's fairly simple. Uh, you import the library, you import the MDS data, and you assign it into uh, test and, and training sets. And then you specify the parameters of the network that you're looking for. So you have to define the input layer to take in those 784 pixels for each image. Then we have a fully connected layer, a dropout layer, which we'll talk about later, but that's to uh, regularize so that um, your data are applicable to a more broader set of data. And then we just do the same thing again. So we have a fully connected layer, dropout, a second fully connected layer, and dropout. And then a softmax layer, we'll see that throughout this talk. It's just a way of, of, of picking from the 10 possible digit outputs and assigning a probability to that. So this is the whole network right here. Very simple, very small amount of code with one layer feeding into the next. That makes sense, right? And uh, then you assign, you tell it you know, what, how you want to learn. So we're using stochastic gradient descent. And then it, it runs the optimizer. And this wouldn't have taken very long, just a few minutes even on my local machine. And it had 99% classification accuracy on the digits if you were willing to take its top three guesses. So the way that these algorithms work is probably using another biological analogy. When you're born, you have far more connections synapses between all of your neurons than you do as an adult. So you kind of start with like this large neural network, lots of connections, and randomly initialized weight between those connections, just like you do in an artificial neural network. Then in your early years, as you start to learn the importance of your mother's voice and your dad's face, or what food you like, the connections, some of the connections are strengthened, and many of them are pruned away, which is analogous to, to what uh, we do with our deep neural networks. Don't take a photo of that slide. I like that. That's the most content dense slide we have. <laughs> this was actually me when I was younger, I had more hair. So I'm not going to go into any of the details of stochastic gradient descent. That's, you know, someone can do a whole lecture on that someday. But there's a specific implementation of Atom that people typically use today in many uh, deep learning algorithms. And this is just a way, it's just a way of minimizing whatever cost you've defined. So whatever you're trying to minimize um, with your learning is typically done by stochastic gradient descent. The, um, something that's unique to deep learning approaches that was developed in the 80s and makes it work so well is backpropagation. So backpropagation is, I'm just, I feel like I should just kind of get more of that. Oh, nice. Well, I can talk about that for 30 seconds for sure. So, just remember the little demon in there in the middle of the network. So, uh, what that propagation enables you to do is it enables you to, to look at, so you feed an image into the network, or set of images into the network, and then you have some assessment of the performance of how well the network was able to classify that image. And where the weights were correct, where they weren't. And what back propagation enables you to do is to very quickly pass through all the layers of your network and figure out what small adjustments might be able to be made to take a step in the direction of classifying correctly um, on the subsequent image. So uh, basically the way that these deep neural networks learn is it's just a constant pass back and forth of Input an image, send the weights through the network that that, that that input creates, evaluate whether the output was correct or not, and if it was not correct, then back, back propagate back through all the layers of your network, figuring out what small adjustments you can do along the way to step towards 
a better model. Wow. I didn't notice that happening behind me. So, um, does anyone have questions? That would be a great time. Yes. Excellent question. Um, it's, it's very difficult to know how many hidden layers you should have. Um, you can learn a lot faster with shorter, with, with shallower networks. So, uh, because layers, um, so if you have a very, very large network, say it has 100 layers in it, which is would be pretty state of the art for you to build one with 100 layers today. The, the very early layers, the first layer, the second layer, they're very far from the image that is trying to be classified correctly or not. And so those, so the, the layers that are very close to that image, the stochastic gradient descent or whatever optimizer you're using can kind of can be more helpful at that end, but then the very deep layers, all the signals kind of lost through that depth. So you kind of want to start with a shallow network. There are only very specific cases where you want to have a very deep network. Um, you might want to think about it kind of anecdotally relative to the complexity of the images you're looking at. So if you were, for example, only trying to classify edges, you'd only want one layer. Let's find out that happens when. Nice. So, uh, overfitting, of course, if you have so many parameters, when you have potentially millions of neurons in a network and billions of ways between them. It's amazing. It's some kind of interaction of my machine with that. I don't know. Yeah. So should I, like, reset my laptop? Well, how much, what does the audience want me to do? Should I try resetting my laptop? Just keep it on. Okay. Doesn't bother me. So, the problem with having so many uh, weights in a network is that you could very easily overfit. So, you know, if you're trying to fit a simple parabola and you're doing it with a with a linear classifier, uh, it's it's not going to fit as well as with a parabolic function. But then, if you add in you know nine or ten um, parameters in your model, you can fit it perfectly, but it's not going to generalize well. So, L1 and L2 regularization are very common approaches uh, that we see throughout machine learning that also work. Dropout is a unique approach where you arbitrarily on each round of the learning you drop out uh, some sets, say half of the neurons at random, and then in the next learning you pick a different half. And that enables generalization to happen um, much better. Or you could expand your data set. So with the MS digits, you could take the original uh, digits and turn them all you know, slightly. There's no way I have time to go through any of these in detail, but there are a set of uh, there, there are kind of a set of ways that you can go about improving neural networks. And I wrote a summary blog post here for doing that, so you can get that link to the slides. I suddenly feel like I'm on a much larger stage. So it goes step by step through how you can uh, fit a network better. And one of the beautiful things is you can prove that any continuous function can be solved by a neural network. So whatever problem you have, you can, you can fix. This we talked about briefly with your question. So basically you have this vanishing gradient. As networks get deeper, it becomes harder and harder to train the lower, uh, the earliest layers of the network. What this is showing is a logarithmic decrease in your ability to train. So learning rate in hidden layer one over training epochs is two orders of magnitude lower than in the fourth layer. And as you add in more layers, that trend continues. So it's become quite a state of the art game to be able to add layers into your network at all. So we talked about AlexNet winning the image competition in 2012. In uh, 2014, the runner up was an image net called BGG. And Google that in 2014, and they won with networks of with layers of 8, 19, and 22, and that was state of the art at the time in 2014. The subsequent year, Microsoft Research Asia came up with their RevNet, which served. 
circumnavigate by means far beyond the scope of this talk um, the, the vanishing gradient problem. And so they had a, a network with 152 layers, and they cut the accuracy or the error rate in half, as you can see. So we're going to talk about um, AlexNet and GoogleNet, or AlexNet and VGNet in detail, because they're relatively simple. So these are kind of classic architectures. They have only a few different kinds of layers in them. We have convolutional layers, which are very important to any kind of these machine vision tasks, but we haven't talked about them yet. Uh, and you can, just, you can see AlexNet is eight layers, VGNet here is 19 layers, and they're basically the same thing. It's just these linear, you're sending uh, your signal through the network linearly, and it goes your inputs go through convolutional layers, a pooling layer, convolutional pooling, fully connected layers. We've talked about a lot of this talk, and then soft max is just to determine um, of the possible categories available, which is most probable. And VGGNet is just an extension of that. So they've just taken the same structure, they've added in one more fully connected layer, and they've added a few more iterations of uh, convolutional and pooling layers. So to remind you guys, inspired by biology, we have these simple um, structures, edges being turned into more complex shapes. And that's the same way that AlexNet was working in 2012, as we discussed already. The convolutional layer specifically is unsurprisingly important in these called convolutional nets. And I'm just going to very briefly talk about them. So if you have an image of a cat, and it's now represented on this block, it has three different um, color layers, red, green, and blue, and it has a height and a width. And what the convolutions do is they pass filters that are the size of this patch over the image. So it just scans it left to right, to bottom to top, and it does, and several different neurons do that simultaneously, and each of these neurons develops its own kind of specialization. Nothing does that, nothing does a better job of illustrating that than this video. So, I'm just going to mute it. So basically, so this is, this is showing the same kind of uh, visualization, or the same kind of uh, test that we showed in the beginning, where the convolutional net is trying to guess what kind of image it's looking at, and here it's guessing with 100% probability that this is a school bus. Right now we're looking at one of the earliest layers of the net, the convolutional layer, and you can see that it's good at picking up the edges of the image. So you, know, you can see here it's guessing 89%. This is a Yorkshire Terrier. I challenge you guys to distinguish a Yorkshire Terrier from a Silky Terrier. And once again, you know, it's, this early layer, this convolutional layer is quite good at distinguishing edges. Here it is Jason Yuskinski, the author of this video and this library. Uh, here he is speaking, and I dream one day to be able to do a talk using his library, like showing you guys on the screen next time. And so, as you move deeper into the, layer, into the layers of the network, the more complex layers, uh, so now we're in the fifth layer here, you can see there are more neurons, and just like in the human brain where we have a fusiform face area, there are neurons specialized to seeing faces. And if his buddy comes into the video, then it sees two faces. So you can kind of see how machines and biology have learned the same ways of structuring our world, which is cool. It's a creepy thing. Here is recognizing the wrinkles in his shirt. So there's a different neuron for that from the face one, which you can still see here in the middle. And this one is recognizing text on books. So it specifically fires to that. So you have all of these different neurons throughout the network that become specialized in recognizing different kinds of objects. And then the final 